where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Good evening, everyone. Praise be to our God. As we have come to not only worship our God, but also to receive from Him. Shall we all turn our Bibles and read the book of Esther, chapter 7? The whole chapter, we will read it responsively. We certainly would want to go to chapter 8, but uh, we will once again uh, focus on uh, the rest of the verses of chapter 7 as well today. Let us read responsibly. Esther Grandam, Edo Adhyayamu, Napadi Vachnalu, Uttara Pratitrani Chadukna. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther, the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of the wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Verse 3, then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if I, sorry, if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that does presume in, this, in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Verse 7. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen. For he saw that there was evil determined against him. By the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Verse 9. And Harbonah one of the chamberlains said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Let us pray and look to the Lord, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for the privilege of coming to, Lord, this privilege of uh, being in your courts and to worship you. How you are a God who is seated on the throne, a sovereign one. And uh, in your providence, you deal with the deliverance of your people. And also, Lord, in the death and the doom of the wicked as well. Father, we come this evening considering your precious word, unworthy, unable as I am from here to do anything. I pray that you may speak through me to me, to each one of us, that in the, in the utterance that is given, in the hearing of your word, our lives may be not only edified but sanctified, that our lives may be strengthened, Lord, to trust you more and also, Lord, to be able to sow and reap in such a way that you would be glorified. We ask that you would bless our time this evening. 
thanking and praising you. For we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As uh, we continue to look at this wonderful book of uh, Esther on the theme of the true providence, it is um, not a surprise. We see so many global events happening uh, in the very time, um, considering the very people of Israel that we are studying, of how things are happening and how in the midst of all that, the God of the Bible, who seemed to be um, just like in the book of Esther, absent in, in, in the manifest presence, he is still in control. He is sovereignly uh, able and is working uh, in the day-to-day -day affairs of man, being the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth on high. So uh, we have come thus far to the book of Esther, chapter 7. Uh, in chapter 7, one of the words that would stand out, uh, that we would come to see in as a theme behind all that we read, is this word called irony. Irony is not a word that we are so familiar with, but uh, it is something that is defined as a state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. Um, when we think about some examples, it is said that uh, Alexander Graham Bell, as he invented the telephone, he refused to keep one of his study, he study uh, assistant, he feared it would distract him from his work itself. Meaning nowadays we have all these telephones or even iPhones and all these phones. We are so much using them to communicate with each other but also are so distant. In the same house we are there, sometimes we are messaging or uh, sometimes we are trying to uh, communicate with the iPhones or the phones. Doesn't mean it's in our house only. <laughs> it happens now and then <laughs> that uh, we might use the gadgets to communicate, but we don't communicate face to face. We don't talk to persons now. Uh, kids are with their gadgets, we are with our gadgets, and uh, we hardly try to talk to each other. There's so much of communication channels, so little of communication that happens. That's one such irony that Abraham Graham Bell, who invented phone for communication, he didn't want to communicate with his assistant. He took him, he fired him out. And uh, another uh, irony is uh, a duct tape is supposed to be used uh, for sealing, but you should never seal the ducts, it seems, because uh, it melts and puts out dangerous fumes. You should use duct tape to seal, but not to seal the ducts. So that's another uh, interesting statement that makes us to understand the irony. Um, also, the ironic uh, way of how God changed a leading church persecutor, Saul of Tarsus, to become an influential leader and a defender is also a way of how God brings out an irony out of a life. Um, so when we look at all these ironies, we'll see one such irony today in the portion that we are going to look at. Um, that is from the book of Esther. And so I'm just going to give a brief outline of this book, uh, of, of this chapter 7, uh, before we dive into the last four sections. So there are two sections that this chapter covers. You'd see that in the first six verses, you'd see the plot of Haman was revealed in the first six verses. As in verse 6, Queen Esther not only reveals that there is a, a danger uh, and a plot that has been devised to have she and her people perish, she brings out in revealing that it is this Haman who has plotted it. And so we're going to consider what we'll see 
uh, in a bit more detail, we're going to look at the reception in the first two verses or the invitation for the second feast that Esther hosts and she receives them, King and Haman and how she receives and what she does. And then in verses three to four, we see about the intercession. Last week we saw briefly about the intercession. And then quickly, last five, two verses, five and six in the first section is going to bring to us the revelation, the revelation of the plot and the enemy of the plot to destroy God's people, which is Haman himself. Now, the second part of the section in verses 7 to 10, it covers to us of how Haman's doom is executed. Not only Haman's plot is revealed in this chapter, Haman's doom is executed. We'll see that uh, in verse 7 and 8, we will see how the indignation or the wrath of the king is going to be hot in such a way that he has no intent to stand this man, but he just leaves as we're going to look at that briefly. And then finally in verses 9 and 10, the execution of Haman. And so this is the brief outline of this chapter as we would look all of these in much more detail. The only two things you should remember is the two outline sections, Haman's plot revealed, Haman's doom executed. Now, that said, in the first verse we see in chapter 7, the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther, the queen. Verse 1 is how Esther receives. And in verse 2, we see Esther serves. And the king said again, unto Esther, on the second day at the banquet of wine. Notice the banquets in the Persian, uh, Persian heritage is focused on the drinks more than any kind of dishes. Unlike ours, we need to have a set of dishes. Uh, we're going to get some Thanksgiving dishes or whatever we'll have. And then the feastings that go on beyond Thanksgiving. In our meals, in our feasts, we are known for a lot of dishes and little of drinks. But in the Persian kind of feast, there's so much focus on the drinks as opposed to any dishes. They might have a little of dishes here and there, but the feast is primarily centered around the, and around the drinks. Some of the times our, our uh, office kind of parties are also centered in that way, uh, more of a professional formal kind of feast. Um, but these are the way, these are the ways in which the Persian feasts are. And so it's focused on the drinks. And so as the drinks were completed and the feast was almost coming to an end, King comes again to make known. He is curious, he is inquisitive of wanting to know what is Esther up to. This is not one feast, this is two feasts. Sometimes we might have this scheme of uh, having something to be opened up. Uh, you might see this happening in our homes in a different way. Our children, they will set us up for something and plan in the right time to reveal exactly when they want what they want, to take note of getting what they want, not to ask something when dad or mom is angry, right? And so is it uh, that Esther had, spent enough time in pleasing the king with not just one but two feasts so far but has not satisfied the curiosity of this husband and king him uh, sorry ashurosh of what is the request that she has and so he goes on to elaborately ask of her what is thy petition what is thy request and so he's ready he's satisfied fully now he wants to know that and so then takes up Esther the opportunity, as we see from verse 3, to bring forth a very powerful plea. As uh, we have looked at this in the last Sunday about this intercession, this, this request as Esther puts her petition is a very powerful plea. It gives to us as to how we as God's people are also to 
come to our God when we intercede. And uh, Esther certainly alludes and even touches on certain things that would cause uh, the king and her husband to respond the way he responds. The first one that she, he does, she does is, first and foremost, she presents about the affection that uh, is upon her in the sense, like she begins her petition in verse 3, then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if I, if it please the king, let my life be, let my life be given me at my petition. The first thing that we take note as a church too, you and I have this great honor of interceding, great honor of coming to the Lord. And we are called to stand in the gap and we are called to be coming to the Lord, taking note that the Lord has loved his church and given himself for us. And so we take note that we have a similar uh, position in reaching out to the King of Kings, much less this King who is being interceded for her wife's life and the affection of whatever he might have for her, it is far less in comparison to the true affection and the true um, great sacrifice that our Lord Jesus Christ has done for his church, that he gave himself up. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 talks about the model of how a husband ought to love his wife in how Christ himself has loved and given himself for her. And so when we come in intercession, it is the privileged position that you and I have as a member of the body of Christ, as a member in the church of the living God, that we get to stand and intercede. Now, not only that, uh, that gives us boldness, but secondly, Esther is not just about herself in, in interceding, but also primarily, she could have been probably if it was all about her safety, she would have stopped there and say, as long as you save me, I'm fine. And not bother to open up about her people that may or may not have that favor that uh, she might have. And so she goes a step forward along with that same petition uh, of her life. She goes on to open up in the second in the second part of verse 3, she says, and my people at my request. And verse 4 also, and if, so for we are sold, I and my people, lo, be, to, sorry, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. And so she is opening up about the affliction of, of her people. Not only the affection that the king as a husband would have for her, but also the affliction of a people group under her, under his reign. And so now quickly, as I uh, conclude on the second part, we see in verse four, she says something very interesting in the second part of verse. Uh, she says, but if we had been sold for bondmen or bondwomen, I had held my tongue. It is just all about some kind of a slavery that we are sold um, and uh, the loss that you as a king would have would be very insignificant. And so she's also alluding to the proposition of value that of loss that the king or the kingdom is going to have in such a wide uh, decree of destruction that was plotted by Haman and the and the, uh, what is what is coming upon God's people, and so he goes on. Uh, she goes on uh, to to say, in a way, to allude to the political proposition uh, and also the valuational, in the sense that there is a, a a political strategy in how this decree was released. It's not so much about whether the people are a law are a are a threat to the king or to the kingdom, 
but it is more of a, a political strategy that was driven by the enemy. And so she opens up uh, a little, not too detailed, on that part. And she says, in the second part, he says, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could have not countervail the king's damage. Meaning, in Telugu, you would find it a little more clearer. He says, she says, it is not worth to bringing it to your notice. Um, for, I mean, in a way, in humility, she says, yes, there will be so many people that would be killed and there will be a loss in the subjects of your kingdom. But more importantly, it might not be something that would be damaging, but this person who plotted, he and his schemes are, are some things that uh, the king can easily override and king can easily undo what the king was made or plotted to be uh, driven to do by the enemy. And so uh, she's bringing some kind of evaluation of the decision that was made earlier. Now, that said, all this is the detail of the intercession. Now, we might uh, take a number of wonderful lessons, but I just would want to draw one quick lesson and then move forward. That is, in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. We all uh, were reminded of this verse as well. But... Uh, the powerful standing as God's people that you and I have is this. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One of the beautiful things about our Lord Jesus Christ is he is the king of kings, yet he is so down to earth that he had undergone everything that a human life would go through. He has undergone and was touched in all points of our infirmities. Not just the temptations, the trials, the sufferings, the afflictions. He had been through it all. He knows when we go through what we are going through. And thereby we can come to him who is merciful. That's why in verse 16 we see, Let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in to, to, to help in time of need. So this is our God, unlike this king who may or may not show mercy, who may or may not be able to give grace, who may or may not understand. This king of kings, he not only understands, but he is afflicted in all our afflictions. He is ready to give mercy and help in time of our very need. And so we have a great high priest who knows us, who intercedes for us. And so alongside of him, you and I are called to intercede. Alongside of him, we have this powerful proposition of intercession to be able to groan with the Holy Spirit of God who has been given, who aids in our intercession. Romans 8, 26 um, talks about this aid of intercessor who has been given to us. Yes, we groan like all the creation that is groaning. Romans 8, verse 20 onwards, there are three groanings that are described there. The first groaning is the creation is groaning. The second groaning, um, as we see in verse 22, the whole creation groaneth. In verse 23, we also are groaning in all the suffering, in all the affliction. In all that we go through in this life, and more than that in verse 26, we see even the Spirit of God together with us is aiding 
and together with us groaning in the sense of of all that is happening around us in which god has to intervene we are interceding for his intervention when god intervenes there is such a difference he doesn't have to do a manifest interception he just needs to have his merciful gracious eye of intervention as he looks he can make things happen even with the day to day affairs of this world just like how he is doing in the time of esther and so we plead for his intervention as we do the intercession and so we have this great high priest who is alongside the great intercessor that is the holy spirit of god groaning through us and so we are called for this great work of intercession and so taking note of how esther does her intercession you and i are encouraged to do so in our day to day lives up uh, approaching the throne of grace and to obtain mercy and grace in time of need now let's move on quickly as we come to esther chapter 7 verses 5 and 6 we come to see about the revelation now when we think about revelation uh, it's not um in in all that ashrosh answered and said unto esther the queen where sorry who is he and where is he that does presume in his heart to do so verse six and esther said the adversary and the enemy is this wicked haman then haman was afraid before the king and the queen here we see of how esther opens up esther uncovers the sin of haman and uh, we see that in first timothy chapter 5 verse 24 there is a, a reality about how sin operates sin is something that would not remain covered till the end First Timothy chapter five, verse twenty-four, gives to us about a, an important principle of how sin operates. Many times in this world we live in, when we look at how people who go on continuing in sin, whether it be wickedness or plotting wickedness, um, or whether they, um, yeah, whether they open up. on what was wronged or not whether they cover it up god has his own way of revealing what is covered first timothy chapter 5 verse 24 it says some men sins are opened beforehand going before to judgment and some men they follow after in a times there are those who are called wicked there are those who operate in such wickedness that everybody knows um everybody knows of how sinful a person is um there were two brothers who were so wicked and that that whole town knew how wicked that those two brothers are and it's told of this famous story that once that brother died a preacher was offered huge amount of money and uh, the brothers rec- the bible gives a principle that is operative of how sin can never remain covered there are those some of the sins who are going before and there are those who are coming behind there is a day of judgment a day of reckoning where every going to be opened up not just for our actions but our intents our motives even those who are serving the lord believers even those in the christ thoughts we had why we thought the way we thought all that is going to be opened up uncovered and so this principle
in uh, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, we read this. For every sin, there is a way out. We don't have to let it stand with us in judgment. But there is a, a wonderful way out that God has made for get out of sin. That is in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Let us 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. This is the principle of how we can get out of the operative principle of sin. If we cover it, it will be exposed even more in a broad daylight. But if we confess it and forsake it, there will be mercy to cleanse and constant. We come to verses 7 and 8, which is the indignation of the wrath of the king. Chapter 7, we read, And the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden. Many times there are many ways in how we express our anger. Sometimes if we have uh, our homes uh, be affected of... There will be sound coming. By the sounds we know that somebody is angry. Uh, or there will be words uh, that would be exchanged in rapid fire. In whatever way uh, anger comes out, one way of how some express anger is they just walk away from that place. Or they'll have a complete silence. So much so that everybody knows that somebody is upset or angry. And whatever means uh, it is going to be demonstrated, we know that anger and indignation is something that is an emotion that was given to us to open up of something that is inside. Anger is a good emotion. God also is angry sometimes. There is righteous anger. When something is not right, when something is wrong, it is to be, as a righteous anger, God is angry against wickedness, against evil. Um, that is the right response. But sometimes anger can be unrighteous and sinful as well. And so here is this indignation of the king. And he, in a way, expresses that he is not able to stand this man's presence and he walks away. So as the king is angered, we come to see in verse 8, the, the king's intent is known to Haman and he goes on to begin to plead to Esther to do something about this wrath and indignation that the king has. And in the process of pleading, Haman, he is now coming to this point of uh, of even trying to do whatever it can be to somehow have Esther intervene that he would be spared of his life. Now, if this is just the anger of a king, of an earthly king, imagine the anger of the king of kings. As I remind us, the description of our God, the God of the Bible, is not just that is a God of love. Yes, the Bible does say God is love. But also on the same note, the Bible also talks about in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 about the reality of the God of the Bible in such a way that there is this stark warning. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. Um, let me read that. It, it is a firm warning. I think I got the reference on the slide wrong. It is 31. Hebrews 10, 31, it says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Even in chapter 12, we come to read about how the God of the Bible is described that he is a consuming fire in verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, 
for our god is a consuming fire the anger of the god of the bible is something that you and i would not want to stand uh, in front of and so this is just the anger of the king and uh, had he probably gone after pleading the kings i don't know if it would have worked out but he chose to plead the queen probably he knew how angry the king was and he thought that's the last hope that he had well sometimes uh, we might choose in some way to to kind of go one route and uh, more than anything that haman has chosen here haman is about to reap what he has sown come with me to the next two verses where we begin to see as soon as the king comes to see the queen being pled and haman on the bed we read in verse 8 the last part that the king's anger is intensified to the highest and says will he force the queen also before me in the house and the words of the king was the tone itself was enough for the guards to take charge and to do what might be the follow up to the king's words in such a way as the word went out of the king's mouth they covered amon's face and uh, in verse 9 we come to read um sorry that uh, amon is beginning to reap what he has sowed in verse 9 and harbona one of the chamberlains and before the king behold also the gallows 50 cubits high which haman had made for mordecai who has spoken good of for the king standeth in the house of haman then the king said hang him thereon so here is a principle another principle that that works in god's economy god's economy is operative in such a way that god will never be mocked many times we think ultimately when god's people are being afflicted or even plotted for destruction or when they are on the verge of destruction we might think that god is going to be mocked or god's name is going to be put to shame but rather than any of such assumption we read in the book of galatians the letter that paul writes to galatians in chapter 6 verse 7 onwards be not deceived be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap the principle of sowing and reaping is operative not just in the world that god created but also in the word as we come to see in everything that we do there is a reaping to what we sow and we are called we are called to be taking note of what we are sowing so in verse 8 onwards as we read galatians chapter 6 verse 8 we read for he that soweth to his flesh shall also of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life everlasting and so this is the principle of sowing and reaping and so there is an encouragement given in verse 9 it says and let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not so there is an encouragement that we ought to take note of what we are sowing whether we are sowing in flesh or in the spirit whether we are sowing in tears or in pleasure and laughter god would want us to sow in tears and reap in great joy as god's word exhorts us that uh, those who sow in tears they will reap the harvest with great joy in psalm and so as we continue to move on we are in the last few 
uh, verse, the last verse. So in verse 10, as Haman is reaping what he is sowing, this is where God, in his own wondrous way, he turns the tables around. God is a God. He is not only at work to have us reap what we sow, but also in the irony, uh, he is showing to us that he is going to turn the tables around even in the last moment. Haman was at the highest of the honor, not just once, twice, but even thrice. He was exalted to be the prime minister. After the king, he was to be the highest in charge. He was so highly exalted. Not only that, even Queen Esther, she happened to invite Haman, not just for the first feast, where along with king, only he was invited. That is of a great honor, the second in exaltation. And thirdly, for not just one feast, but the second feast as well. He's of the pinnacle of honor, being of the most powerful kingdom, second to the king. And so, if the king were to be dead, this is the man who is the most powerful one upon this whole earth. Such was his exaltation. Such was his honor. Now, when we take note of the highest of the honor, when we think about how God would let such exaltation come to even such a wicked people, we are to be reminding ourselves that we ought not to be fretting. We ought not to be fret, uh, as the psalmist talks about in Psalm 34, Psalm 37, in verse 1. Psalmist David, he takes note of this way of operation in this world. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. We ought not to take that to be the permanent way of how God would let things happen. There will be a time where God would turn the tables around. As we turn to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27, we come to see how, um, when I think about irony, I was reminded in our childhood, uh, for children, it is even the little things are enough for them to uh, cause, to enjoy uh, a laughter. If, uh, if a man who goes one way, not bothered about cleanliness, is going to throw a banana peel and walks back and stamps on the same peel and falls down, that's enough for a child to laugh. Uh, that's just the irony, how people who are not bothered would end up reaping what they sow. And when I was in, uh, probably in my schooling, I was uh, being part of uh, my dad who was serving or who was working in forest department. We, we had uh, been put into some kind of a uh, an essay writing or a, a drawing competition that happened in the department. And I remember once I chose to draw a diagram in that, di in that uh, di drawing competition. Of course, I didn't get any prize. I'm not a good uh, artist or any way. But I was fondly reminded of what I drew then. I, was, I drew uh, a picture of a man who is seated on a branch that he is cutting. That uh, <laughs> I mean, the reason I drew that picture is this, that I was having to draw with the theme of deforestation, uh, of how people are cutting to destroy themselves. And so in that picture, I drew that a man is cutting his own branch that he is seated. And so many times the irony of the story of how even in God's word that we see in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27, that God is a God who turns the table around. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. 
And so is it that God is going to turn back on them who do what iniquity, whatever they sow, it is going to come upon them. And so the one wonderful lesson that we learn from uh, this story of Haman and his doom here is in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 5. Let us read that verse all together and then we'll close with one or two more comments. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 5. All together. Proverbs 11, verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Here is God's people who stood for the rightness of what God wanted them to do. Mordecai didn't honor a wicked Haman who longed for a personal worship of some kind of an honor and exaltation. God's people are called to only worship the true and the living God and none else. When God saw the righteousness of the righteous, he honored Mordecai with the due honor that the king gave. When the wicked Haman was plotting to destroy and being exalted to the such heights, we come to see that the same wickedness has brought such destruction as the word of God resoundingly says in verse 5, the wicked shall fall by their own wickedness. And so as we see God turning the tables around, we have a greater uh, work of God far more than this unseen work in the book of Esther. The true work of enemy being disarmed has been done already. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, we all know how our Lord Jesus Christ, he humbled to such depths of lowliness that he took your place and mine when we were in bondage to an enemy that he had come and had uh, faced this enemy and his work and destroyed and disarmed him. Let's read Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 as uh, Paul describes about how a Lord Jesus Christ, he, he took head on the enemy and he disarmed him and his work, that is the principalities and the powers as everything that was against us in the ordinances and everything, he had nailed it to the cross and he has disarmed the enemy. Let us read verses 14 and 15. Colossians 2, verse 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Here we come to see the beginning of the tables being turned around. We don't see that the people of God have completely been delivered yet. It is the enemy being disarmed. The plot of the enemy is yet to be destroyed later. But we come to see the enemy being doomed yet. Uh, in Esther chapter 7 verse 10, we read, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath pacified. When God was having his son bear all the wrath, as he took the wrath that deserved to be poured upon you and me for all that we have piled up in our sinfulness as the anger. When Jesus took that wrath, he appeased, he was totally propitiating, he was making a, a substitutionary atonement in such a way that he had put to shame the enemy and he has dis disarmed him completely as we have read in verse 15. And so not only the enemy is disarmed, the enemy's work in the, 
in the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ had been destroyed. We read in 1 John chapter 2, sorry, chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. We read, let's read verse 8, the last part. Sorry, I think I had a wrong reference there. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the last part. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Here is our Lord Jesus Christ in the work that he did. That uh, not only the God of Esther, the book of Esther, he intervenes and turns the tables around. But our Lord Jesus Christ, he interjects the wrath of God and he disarms the enemy. He destroys the work of the enemy. In that, the enemy had been made powerless. The enemy had been made powerless. You know what? In spite of enemy being made powerless, he's still the enemy. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, for Peter warns us about the work of the enemy, as what he is up to. The work of the enemy, though he is disarmed, though his works are destroyed, he's still there lurking. And uh, what he is up to is to devour who are godly, to destroy in whatever way the testimony, destroy in whatever way our lives uh, from serving God and to make us to be dejected and to be destroyed. And so Peter, as he wants, he says, Thine enemy he is like a roaring lion be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour many times when we see a lion you and i are terrified yes even satan might look terrifying but the work that jesus had done is like he has shattered the teeth of all the mouth of the lion and yet the enemy is there trying to roar against us many times in different ways. And because he cannot crush us with the bone crushing teeth that he would have had, he is wanting to swallow us whole. That's what it says, right? The enemy, like a roaring lion, he is walking about seeking whom he may devour to swallow us. He can't bite us. I mean, of course, he might do so many things. But in a way, our Lord Jesus Christ has utterly disarmed him. So much that he has disarmed him that the victory is already declared. The enemy's defeat is already sealed. Take note of this promise that God has given as Paul reminds the book, the church at Rome. And with this verse, we'll close. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20, we'll close with this verse. Let us read it all together. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. This is a settled, sealed deal. I don't know whose side you want to be. Somebody has already declared victory. Or victorious. And it's a choice given that you and I can take the side and be in the team that is victorious. And here is our Lord who has not just disarmed the enemy, destroyed his work, but he has the defeat sealed so much so that this is a promise. Shortly he's going to crush Satan under your feet. For the church of God, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What a victory that the Lord Jesus Christ has made. And thanks be to God for such a victory. And so as we take note of chapter 7, I want to just show to you of how the tables are turned around. Chapter 7 can be summed up from honor to horror. Of This is the enemy's path. He's of great honor is going to be brought to great horror. The path of 
the godly in what Mordecai had gone through is that he was in, he was set up for gallows, but he was brought to great honor. That is how our Lord turns the tables from honor to horror, as we saw the, the fate and the destiny of Haman. We know about the greater enemy that, our Lord, that Satan is and how our Lord had utterly destroyed him. And in that victory, may we be victorious, may we be overcomers, may we be not still defeated by the, by the temptations that come from the enemy, but by the grace of God that is there, you and I are called to be more than conquerors, more than overcomers. To him that overcometh, as God has promised through the pages of the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, every church has been promised with this promise of overcoming. May that be our portion, that God who has given us this victory may keep us victorious to be triumphant in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray and ask the Lord for his blessing. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this privilege you gave to be together in considering your precious word. Yes, Lord, you are a God who allows us to come with intercession. You are a God who brings to light everything in revelation of all our condition. In our sin, you want us to be brought to confession that we may forsake and not be brought to condemnation in judgment. Father, we pray that you may allow us to not to cover our sin, but to confess and forsake it. But also, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, that uh, you're a God who turns the tables around and brings execution of all that you have purposed in your sovereign will. Lord, even in the day-to-day -day affairs of man, your intervention is is enough, Lord, to have your sovereign will be brought to pass. We thank you, we praise you for the victory that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ, how the enemy has been disarmed, how the enemy's work has been destroyed, how the enemy's de defeat has been sealed. May it be so, Lord, that we may be victorious in our walk with you, to be able to glorify thee in and through a life that would overcome every temptation and thereby, Lord, have you be lifted up high in and through our lives. We ask for your blessing upon this word. May that become our reality. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, communion of Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us both now and forevermore.